In this problem, we'll solve a second-order differential equation involving the motion of a mass spring damper system. The mass spring damper system is a quintessential problem in mechanical engineering. It's the basis of your vibrations course, and they can also be used to represent more complex mechanical systems, such as a vehicle suspension system. A typical mass spring damper configuration consists of a mass connected to a wall by a spring and a damper. Let's pretend the damper isn't there for now. We'll reintroduce it momentarily. Suppose we apply a rightwards external force, U of T. When the mass and spring move to the right, the spring stretches. From Hooke's law, we know that the force produced by the spring equals K times X, where K represents the elasticity of the spring and X is how much the mass moved from its equilibrium position. The direction of the spring force opposes the direction of the mass's motion, so since the mass is being pulled to the right, the spring force points to the left. If the mass was moving to the left, the spring force would point to the right. Basically, the objective of the spring is to bring the mass back to its equilibrium position. You might remember from your Physics 1 class that setting a mass spring system in motion results in simple harmonic oscillations. The oscillations would continue indefinitely, but obviously this doesn't happen in real life. In reality, a vibrating object will vibrate with a progressively decreasing amplitude until it eventually stops moving. The damper represents the combined effects of all the various mechanisms for dissipating energy in the system, including friction, air resistance, material deformation losses, and so forth. It acts pretty similarly to the spring. If the mass is dragged to the right by the external force U of T, the damper will produce a force that acts opposite to U of T. Similar to how Hooke's law states that the spring force is F equals K times X, the force produced by the damper is F equals C times X dot. Whereas the spring force is proportional to the displacement of the mass, the damper force is proportional to the mass's velocity. Just as a higher K means you have a stiffer spring, a higher C means you have a damper which dissipates more energy out of the system. So just to recap, when you introduce the damper into the system, the vibrations eventually die out because the damper takes away energy from the system. This is a more realistic representation of vibrations in everyday life. The system's kinematics are governed by this second-order differential equation. We won't derive this, but I want to point out a few things. We have U of T on the right-hand side, which is just the externally applied force. The units of U of T is newtons, so every group of terms on the left-hand side must also be in newtons. The mx double dot terms represents the mass's inertia. This is just the mass times acceleration, which is a force, which obviously has units of newtons. C times x dot must have units of newtons, so that means that units of C equals newtons times second over meters, or equivalently, kilograms per second. Finally, the kx term we know represents the spring force, which we know has units of newtons as well. Because this is a second order ODE, we need two initial conditions. We need to specify the mass's initial position and velocity. For now, we'll just use the placeholders x naught and x dot naught, or alternatively v naught, to represent the mass's initial position and velocity. Now that we have a basic general understanding of the mass spring damper system, let's fill out the cause effect diagram. The first forcing function is hopefully obvious. It's just U of T, the externally applied force. But the initial position and velocity are also classified as forcing functions because changing either one will drive the system differently. The system parameters are M, C, and K. These define the makeup of the physical system. And finally, the responses are the mass's position and velocity. These are the quantities we are interested in obtaining. Okay, that's the cause-effect diagram. The next part of the problem wants us to write a function m file to numerically solve the second-order ODE using MATLAB's ODE45 function. Unfortunately, ODE45 can only solve first-order ODEs, but we have a second-order ODE. Therefore, we need to recast this second-order ODE into a system of first-order ODEs so we can utilize ODE45. The way we typically do so is by introducing some new variables which represent the lowest-order derivative all the way up to one less than the highest-order derivative. In this case, the highest-order derivative is 2, so we will use two variables, z1 and z2, which will represent x 
and x dot, respectively. The next step is to differentiate z. When we do so, the x becomes x dot, and this x dot becomes x double dot. The z dot vector represents the system of first order ODEs we will plug into ODE 45 to get the z vector. But we're not done just yet. We need to express x dot and x double dot in terms of z1 and z2. Notice that we originally defined z2 equals x dot, but we also said when we differentiated z that z1 dot equals x dot. Let's write that in below. Notice that we can get x double dot from the original ODE. If we do some quick algebra and solve for the x double dot term, we get the following. But we're still not done because we need to change all the x's to z's. We already established that z2 equals x dot and z1 equals x, so we can plug those in down here and further simplify the equation. This is how we express a second order ODE into a series of first order ODEs. This is what we'll be plugging into MATLAB when we call the ODE45 function. The way this equation is currently written can be a little difficult to digest, so this is just the same equation rewritten in matrix form. If you expand out the matrices, you'll get the same result as what we just derived up here. The extra stuff over here is a separate matrix for the forcing function u of t, which we define separately as a convention. You can really see that this just takes the form z dot equals az plus u, which is a first order ODE. It just so happens that z dot is a two by one vector of first order ODEs. This is a good stopping point. To recap, we introduced the mass spring damper system, drew the cause effect diagram, and rewrote the second order ODE into a system of first order ODEs. We did not actually write the function m file to solve the system of ODEs, but we'll do that immediately in the next video. See you next time.